This is the Unachieved Podcast, episode 290. I had many doubts and, um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, my resilience has certainly been tested. I think what I have learned in, yeah, as a player, as a coach, administrator of management is that it's not always going to be a straight line and you've, you've got to be flexible and you're just going to have to deal with the challenges and get back on the horse and sometimes uh, you get, you know, you get bucked off real hard but it's, you know, you, you know people in a, in, a, in a position that I'm in, if I don't show resilience, I can't expect you know, everyone else to show resilience. G'day, this is the Chief Podcast, episode 290, and today we continue our best of series with Melbourne Rebels CEO, Baden Stevenson, on leading high performers and giving clarity to your organisation. I am your host, Greg Layton, founder of Chiefmaker and the Council of Chiefs, and I believe there is a great chief in all of us, and that through listening to the stories strategies and techniques of great CEOs, each of you can find and leave your own legacy through your work. The Inner Chief podcast is where you will learn how to think and make moves like a CEO. For over a decade, I've helped CEOs and senior executives around the world boldly lead change, inspire their people and leave a legacy. So every two weeks, I'll bring a deep diving interview with one of these CEOs or another one of a mid to large organization so you can find your own path to greatness as an executive. In this episode, I chat to Baden Stevenson. His path to becoming the CEO of a professional rugby club, the Melbourne Rebels, has been different to most. He transitioned from the coaching to operations departments and finally got his role as CEO in 2017. He was heavily involved as a general manager of rugby when, in 2017, The Melbourne Rebels luckily managed to save their Super Rugby licence under controversial conditions. Ultimately, when that process concluded, he was selected to lead the club into the future and is still at the helm to this day. Today, you're going to hear Baden talk all about having empathy for your people and showing that they are valued, dealing with huge uncertainty and keeping staff motivated, the contagion of your emotions within an organisation and leading high performers in a professional environment. Now, Chief, do you want to go on a journey where your leadership shifts from being intuitive to being practical, systemized, and inspiring? That is the way one of our students has described the Mini MBA, a transformational program where we work with you on your business to systemize the way you lead and to get Results. So much so that I guarantee results. If you're not happy with the program, I'll give you 100% of your money back. In fact, the NPS for the program is over 91. That absolutely, to be honest, it belts our opposition. I think the best in the market wouldn't even be just over seven. So we are absolutely leading the game in a program that matches the most cutting edge material in the market with cutting edge coaching skills. And that is where so much of the other programs in the market fall over. They can't do both. They're not bad at coaching or they're not bad at materials. We're the best at both. Righto, Chief, if you want to get involved, check out chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA. Righto, Chief, let's hear from our superb guest, Baden Stevenson. Baden Stevenson, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Mate, can you tell us a bit of a story that sums up your childhood? I want people to understand where you come from and what it was like growing up. Oh, you grew up in Canberra, right? So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, look, I grew up in Canberra with a, a, an elder brother, younger sister, uh, quite a humble and caring family. Um, not necessarily a story, but my mother was one of eight children and obviously a, a big extended family. So our Christmas, each Christmas we'd all go back to uh, you know, Nan and Pop's place uh, in New South Wales country uh, in a little town called Young. So my Christmas memories of, of, of growing up, they, were, they only lived in quite a small three-bedroom house. And as you could imagine, with eight, eight uh, um, uncles and aunties and, uh, and I think nearly 20 grandkids, uh, Christmas was very, very hectic. Yeah, it was great fun. And uh, yeah, we had people sleeping on verandas and in the shed and on floors and yeah, a great family uh, Christmas. Oh, absolute pure chaos. That just sounds... My, my family Christmases were very similar. I'm one of five, so we had these big, crazy Christmases every year. It was just fantastic. Uh, I don't know how my parents survived the... the... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now, listen, tell me, so you grew up in the, in Canberra, and what did you do after school? Where did you go? Yeah, I, I was uh, I went to, straight to university at uh, University of Canberra, and I was playing playing rugby in, at, at a time in Canberra, uh, pre-Super Rugby. So, yeah, the club competition was very strong, and it's really funny looking back. I was, I was on a panel recently, and thinking back about those days in Canberra and, and the guys that I yeah, I went to university with, and there was you know, Rod Kafer, George Gregan, Matt O'Connor, Nick Scrivener, uh, Joe Roth uh, yeah, but came behind us, and uh, yeah, there was uh, Michael Maguire. So there was, uh, and we're all doing similar courses in and around sports science and teaching, and uh, yeah, see each other at uni and see each other at rugby training and coming, coming through the system there. So I went to university and finished my degree, and I thought to myself, I... Uh, I won't go straight into teaching. I'll have a year out and I'll work in rugby. As it pans out, I've never taught a day in my life. Followed a different pathway. Yeah, right. So you went into this rug- world of rugby management and then into rugby operations and even rugby coaching. I, th- I think I saw on your profile. You were head coach a visit of SACOM in Japan. Yeah, yeah, no... It was part of my experiences, but yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure which path I wanted to go down either. So I, you know, I, I built a number of experiences and 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 all qualifications as well. Um, worked in administration and management, and and then yeah, while I was still playing and working at the club, I, I branched out to coaching. I, I think I coached ACT schoolboys uh, for for five years while while I was still playing. So that was uh, yeah a good segue, and then I got some opportunities to to coach assistant coach at the Canberra Vikings, and then head coach at the Tuggerong Vikings, which was the club that I finished playing with and then had an opportunity to go and uh, be a head coach and coaching professionally in Japan which was a fantastic experience. Tell me about that because that's a, that would be a very interesting role that I think a lot of people would be fascinated by. What was that like over there in Japan and your first overseas head coaching job of a professional club? Oh, it was a huge learning experience and a great challenge finding your feet as yeah, only in my second year as a head coach, but in a foreign country where you, know, you had the, the language barrier. So I was fortunate enough, the, cl- the company that I worked for had a full-time interpreter, but I quickly worked out that um, you know, if it if he was going to repeat every word I said, it was yeah, training sessions, meetings, etc. Yeah, we almost double the time. So uh, yeah, I worked out in that first month while I was finding my feet. Yeah, I needed to, needed to shift the way I communicated and uh, and also yeah to to um, yeah to, to build relationships with absolute strangers. I think most most rugby teams that I'd been involved with. Yeah, prior to that, you know, I always knew someone or, or connected, you know, because it was mostly all in Australia. But yeah, when you go to Japan and, you know, I just remember arriving and having, and there was, they had big squads back then. So I had you know, a photo on the fridge and in my bedroom of the 45 uh, Japanese players that I knew absolutely nothing about. And many of them, many of them looked very similar. So it took me a while to get to know their nicknames and, uh, and off we went. But yeah, certainly a great, a great challenge and great learning experiences, as I said. In those moments, what do you think you learned about yourself? about coaching in such a difficult environment where communications is hard. What did you learn about Baden in those moments? Yeah, I thought, oh, there was so many learnings. Uh, yeah, I think the the need to be, um, yeah, to be super organised and, um, you yeah, and I think building, yeah, coming in, coming to a club overseas and, and many coaches that do go overseas, you need to build trust and respect really quickly. Uh, and the fact that I'd played and coached in Australia didn't really mean too much to, to the Japanese. It was all about, uh, you know, you, you're here to do a job. And I, I remember in my first week I, I caught the train in with my interpreter you know, went up to the head office at, uh, for SECOM in Harajuku and you know, went up to the top floor and overlooking the city and this, uh, the chairman or the CEO's office was was about uh, you know the size of a 22 metre football field that had a you know, it had a boardroom table at one end and a leather couches at another end and a bar in the middle and and uh, I remember the meeting was particularly short he uh, he basically said to me welcome you must win and when we win, we'll drink expensive champagne. And that was that was about it. Then there was a, pre- a pregnant pause, and uh, the meeting was all over after three sentences. So, so the expectations were set fairly quickly. So, how much of that expensive champagne did you get to drink? Uh, that's the big question. <laughs> Unfortunately, not enough. Um, the, 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 the Japanese, are, as, as we know, they're, they're great hosts and great people. Yes, so, look, yeah, they they um, yeah they they looked after yeah certainly myself and the family and the, and the management team. Um, but mm. but unfortunately, we yeah we didn't quite. Uh, yeah, uh, achieve all of our goals while I was there. I think one of the most enjoyable countries you'll ever travel to is, is Japan. Now, look, Baden, as your career went along, there's a few setbacks in your life. Um, a number of years ago, your wife was diagnosed with cancer, and I know that was a very challenging time for you. Tell us, what was that like, and how did you how did you cope through that and then grow and come out of that? Because I know now she's in full remission, she's fine now, so how did you get through that? 
yeah, it was it was a particularly tough time in my life, and uh, and obviously for, for Kate as well. So, I, I um, yeah, I crammed a hell of a lot into this one particular year, and it's almost a blur. I think I was. I was working full time at the, at, at the Vikings. I was co uh, assistant coach for the Canberra Vikings. I was doing my level three coaching course. I was also doing a, a diploma in business, and we had a one year old, and, and then Kate was uh, diagnosed with cancer. So, uh, when you ask how how did I deal with it, I, if I'm totally honest, I didn't deal with it very well at all. Um, there was, yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah, you know, I was too, my ego, or yeah, you know, I didn't want to let anyone down, so I didn't, yeah, you know, I should have dropped. Or, or pull back on some of those commitments, and unfortunately, I wanted to be something to everyone, and um, yeah, and I, and I pushed myself through that, and, and ultimately, you know, I think retrospectively, I, you know, I should have been yeah sitting in the chemo ward or, or putting more time, yeah, you know, with, with with Kate, and that should have been my priority at, at that particular time, and so yeah, it was a big a big, lear big learning, and um, yeah, you know, I pushed through it. I think that. Uh, yeah, you know, now now when I um, yeah dealing with you know, dealing with people, I, I think that it certainly improved my you know, emotional empathy for, for for players and staff when they've got family issues. Uh, having having gone through that experience myself. Yeah, I was going to ask how this has shaped the way you operate now, but I think you've just answered that. Mm. And that this is a much greater level of empathy. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. So, um, yeah, and what's quite bizarre is that I still haven't got, <laughs> haven't got my my balance or, or my priorities always right with the family. Yeah, even even today, fifteen years later. But yeah, I think that yeah, that those personal experiences that, and yeah, you can you can tell pretty quickly when yeah you know, a player or a staff member yeah if if it means a lot to them and and um, yeah it's got to do with their family. Yeah, you know, I think that. In the sporting environment, yeah, it's important that we've you know, got everyone committed. But there will be times when yeah, family has to come first, and, and that's something that I've, I've learnt and, and, and tried to yeah, tried to work with with, with players and coaches and staff to um, yeah, show that empathy. So, first CEO role end of last year, the clubs come out of incredible drama. Actually, let's talk about that period because that was just before you were uh, in the under in the year leading up and. Um, a lot of people won't be aware of the challenges the Red Bulls went through. Like throughout 2017, there was one of the two, so one of two clubs really was going to lose their license to compete in the Super Rugby competition, which is arguably the most, the most prestigious competition in the world. One of them was this club, and uh, I know a few people that were here, and I could see the stress that they were going under as the yeah. club's future was threatened. Yeah. What was it like being on the inside? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was really tough. Uh, there's, there's no no way to yeah to sugarcoat it. It was it was highly highly emotional and highly stressful. And yeah, when when you also throw in uncertainty, uh, yeah, that's a that's a yeah, it's just a character or a feeling that 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 no one likes. And, and I found out that yeah, from players to staff to to management, yeah, that uh, everyone yeah deals with uncertainty in different ways. But it's not it's, it's not a nice thing to go through. And look, we were you know, sometimes uncertainty might last for you know, a day or, or, or you know a week, but this this was ongoing for months. And so you know, I had I had players in tears in my office. I had, I had uh, wives and kids of, of players and staff that yeah you know, they had strong relationships, and they're saying, well, yeah, you know, do I enroll in school? Do I yeah you know, do I take out a lease? Yeah, you know, what are we doing? Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah, what's the you know, what's the future hold? And, and when you can't answer that, it's uh, it was pretty tough. That's right. It's the the things that people don't expect is people have got to plan their future. When their future is not planned, they yeah. don't know if they should enroll their kids in school because yeah. they might not be here next year. Should That's they right. get a lease on a house? What about their financials? Yeah. Everything just yeah. re really mushrooms, I suppose, out of control. Yeah. So on the out of that, th thankfully the Rebels came through. They've kept their license. They had a, they had a really good year this year mm. um, in, in many ways. Um, but at the end of last year, you, you announced as a CEO to lead the club into the future. How did it feel to, to get that job, the, the first CEO role for you? And, and what was it like in the first couple of weeks there? Yeah, look, it, the, the timing to be announced uh, for CEO um, was quite strange. I think it was in June last year, so we actually had to finish the season, um, and then we still didn't know what our future actually uh, holds. So, so at it, that point, you didn't know if you no, were all oh, well. Wow. No, so it could have been I could have been the shortest uh, <laughs> um, CEO in Rebels history. Although, having said that, there's been. Uh, there's been a range of uh, CEOs uh, in the eight-year history, so there was a lot of uncertainty. So even getting the appointment, 
I really didn't know, yeah, what 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 the next few months, um, yeah, uh, was on the, was on the horizon, uh, and then I think in August, uh, after I'd been in the job for two months, we got the green light to say that you know that the rebels had survived, and at that stage, I yeah, you just walked through the office here, but yeah, there's there's only four four offices in the building, and everything else is open planning, and yeah, that's uh, yeah my office, and then I'd walk past an empty GM of commercial office, an empty GM of rugby office, and an empty head coach office. So, for and that 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 yeah continued for about two or three months. So I I really did feel that you know um, that yeah I was probably one of a four man team, and uh, <laughs> yeah I was under the pump. And, yeah. Yeah. CEO of no one. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Everyone did what you said, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was no back chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so on to uh, this year, and as you've got it, your feet under the desk. Um, I think there's a few things I think people would love to understand because you, know, you, you had a different career path. You, you went through coaching and then you went into rugby operations. A lot of people have to go through their own technical professional world. But I think the key question for me is what have you been able to learn from? the life in elite sport of coaching that has really primed you for leading an administration and an organisation? What, yeah. What's been translatable for you? Yeah, I think the two biggest things that I've, I've really learned um, that, 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 that correlate across is that, is that yeah, you, you're not going to be liked by everyone and, uh, and you also can't do everything. So, yeah, when, when, yeah, when I yeah, very first started with CEO and, and working with a couple of board members, yeah, there was just so much to do. And we also, yeah, we had to, yeah, prioritise. Yeah, we, yeah, we want there was multiple things to get done, but we, yeah, we had to work on a timeline and slowly tick them off. So, I think, um, yeah, with any organisation that's growing, it's uh, it's really important to, yeah, to have the ability to work out, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a journey, and to, to prioritise certain things. Yeah, and we needed to fix, yeah, our three pillars in our club. We needed to fix the rugby program. We needed to fix our commercial. Um, you know, financial sustainability and we needed to reconnect with the community so yeah we've made a lot of progression over the last you know, nine months but yeah it's taken time and there's still a, a long way to go and what I'm reading is the simplification of that, just three messages there's a, there's a thing on let's sport just yeah. three messages all yeah. the time like yeah. keep it really really yeah. simple so is that the thing you sort of translate keep it yeah. simple but yeah. effective the highest impact yeah. things we can do yeah no, definitely, and look, uh, yeah, what it's also taught me is is the importance of um, you know, of getting the right people and, and getting, yeah, getting. You know, I was quite fortunate that you know, that I have actually been able to come into the role, yeah, you know, um, through yeah you know, through some bizarre situations, but yeah, you know, I am I have, have did get the opportunity to yeah you know, to bring in my and build my own team around me, which which has been good, and that's still yeah you know, that's still ongoing. I've got a new general manager of commercial starting actually on the thirteenth of August, so that's probably the final piece of. Of, of putting pulling together a management team, um, and um, yeah, and yeah, but that that does does take time. But yeah, and as you said, yeah, keeping keeping things reasonably simple. Mm. Now, do you still have moments where you doubt yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, how do you get through those moments? Yeah, look, well, I think um, you know, I think you just got to back yourself. Um, there's there's been plenty of times I've I've driven home and yeah, and thought yeah, how am I? What's next? How am I going to deal with this? Yeah, what have I learnt, and and uh, yeah, how can I get to some outcomes quicker? Yeah, look, the, so there's, there's lots of learnings, but I, I think I, I think it, it's a it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, there's certain things you can can control. Prioritising those and, and focusing on those, because you know, when I very first started, there was so much noise, and if if you know, looking back, you know, and I did have certain people say, yeah, try and try and block out the noise, but you know, I was in a new role, I was trying to. Yeah, build respect and trust with the board, but I had people in the community. I had yeah, uh, a whole range of people touching base with me because they cared, which I appreciated. But at the time, there were just so many voices, mm-hmm. and and yeah, you know, not yeah, you know, I, I had so much to do, and I almost that yeah, you know, it took me a little while to sort of work out yeah, you know, where do I start and how do I get to first base sort of thing. So, but yeah, look, I I had many doubts, and um, yeah, I think it's yeah, you know, my resilience has certainly been tested. I think what I have learnt in yeah, as a player, or as a coach, administrator, or management, is that it's not always going to be a straight line, and you you've got to be flexible, and you get you're just going to have to deal with the challenges and get back on the horse. And sometimes uh, you get yeah you get bucked off real hard, but it's yeah you do, yeah people in a in a in a position that I'm in, if I don't show resilience, I can't expect yeah everyone else to show resilience. Chief, are you interested in understanding how to turn the company strategy into an execution plan? 
how to get momentum and traction in the business, how to lead your people, inspire them to make change happen, and how to deal with tricky stakeholders and and make projects happen in the real world. Well, if that's what you're after, then the mini MBA in leading high performance teams is for you. Go to chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA to find out more. We run the program about every quarter and we'd love to hear from you if you or the people that you work with are interested. Once again, chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA. What about feedback? Now, in, in, in sporting world, I don't think people in the corporate world understand feedback until you go inside in a, mm. an elite sporting environment where the feedback can be incredibly direct yeah. and can literally pull at some of your yeah. deepest yeah. insecurities. <laughs> a question I have always loved is what is the best feedback you've ever received? And I, I don't just mean stuff that was like, hey, you're fantastic. I mean something that almost stung you a bit. Mm. It stung you in a way went, I needed to hear that. Yeah. And the reason it stung you is because you knew it was true. Yeah. Have you had feedback like that? Yeah, I, I had feedback and I had an experience. Actually, when I got back from Japan, I, I had a year out of rugby and I worked for an orthopedic company in clinical support and, and sales. And uh, yeah, and that was quite confronting and completely out of my comfort zone. And, and there, there are, you know, I know a number of rugby players or ex-people that have, that have taken that career path. And um, I just remember going through my training and, and I was looking after, you know, I was living in Sydney and I was looking after regional New South Wales and Canberra and, and the parts of Sydney and I, one of my first cases um, that I did by myself without any, anyone there, I, um, this, the orthopaedic surgeon had an issue getting one of the, the, the trial uh, pieces out, out, of the, uh, yeah, out, of the, out of the shoulder and anyway, the, you know, I directed him, you know, as I thought that I should, anyway, it, it could. So this is during surgery. During surgery. So you're in, yeah, this, you're yeah, in, this, so in the yeah, clinic, yeah, sorry, in the yeah. theatre. Theatre. And you're saying, so yeah. this bit to this bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so there's, there's five toolkits there, and you've got your your, your, your light pointer, and, and you're, you're telling the scrub staff to put this together and do this, and, and talking to the surgeon as you, as you go. And anyway, I could see that the surgeon wasn't familiar with, with the with the gear and, and he was becoming quite stressed and you could see and you know when you got a green mask on I could see the sweat coming down and his eyes were piercing I just remember yeah the we got there in the end but he gave me some very very direct feedback at the end of the case and I, I hopped in my car you know with the, after kicking pebbles out to the car park and I hopped in the car and he said do not ever turn up into my surgery if you do not 100% know what what yeah, what you're doing, mm. which is fair call in that in that environment. And anyway, I spoke to my my direct manager, and and yeah, he's. I talked him through exactly what I said and what I did, and he said, "What you yeah, ultimately what you said was right, but you didn't back yourself. And when the heat really came on, yeah, you almost second guessed yourself. You should have. Mm. You should have. You should. You remained confident and calm, and and yeah, remained on message." And yeah, and that was quite a stressful you know, time for me. But I just remember that feedback, and I, and I and yeah, you know, I, I drove back to Sydney, and yeah, you know, it was um, it was very confronting. But yeah, you know, I took it on board, and yeah, you know, after after having a couple of beers that night <laughs> to, to, to de-stress, I actually thought, well, he's probably one hundred percent right, and mm-hmm. what have I learned from it? And and uh, yeah, you know, I sort of take those sort of experiences. Yeah, you know, you, and as you said, in sport. It's not a normal environment. Every Monday morning or every day, the coach, the manager, the, the CEO, the leadership group, yeah, the, everyone's giving feedback. And um, yeah, you've got to be able to give it, also receive it, uh, and also learn from it. Okay, let's talk a bit about, um, I suppose, staying the course. And I, I like to understand what is someone's routine or the way they prioritise. So how do you stay focused? So is it a morning focus session of some sort? Like, how do you just, every single day, how do you reset? Mm. Now, good, good question. Look, yeah, I am a, a, a man of routine. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, yeah, and look, I, I function better in the mornings than, than what I do in, in the evenings. So, yeah, if I if and when I do do exercise, I do it first thing in the morning. Um, and then, likewise, yeah, I think yeah, starting the day yeah with with a clear mind and you know clean desk and and trying to sort of. Set the tone for the day in a, in those first first couple of hours is the way that you know, that I work. Um, so how do you do that? Do you sit down with your strategy or your calendar and you go, okay, now the focus this week is and the outcomes I need. What are the kind of questions you ask yourself? Yeah, no, I think I think 
because there's so so many moving pieces, I think first and foremost, understanding you know your commitments and your calendar, uh, and then also you know. Who, who, you, who you need to be dealing with almost on a day-to-day basis. So I know it's very much old school, but you know I can have my whiteboard filled or, or, or my phone or my to-do list and just you know, ticking people off the list so that, um, because it, you know, I find that if I don't write you know, certain things down, mm-hmm. that you can, you can, you know, things can get lost. So. so you're ticking off your stakeholders, which are yeah. in, in the CEO yeah. role yeah. is probably the first role where all of a sudden you've yeah. got every stakeholder under the sun that wants to talk to you. Yeah. And managing those stakeholders is yeah. a huge part yeah. of CEO life compared yeah. to the levels below that. Yeah. So you're just making sure you're ticking those off yeah. you know, on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, elite sport is a world of high performance, yeah. very aspirational in, in individuals. Like in the corporate world, I sort of yeah. refer to them as thoroughbreds. Like you get these people that are just so energetic and aspirational that yeah. you've got to give them, yeah. you know, a bit of a, you've got to push them, you've got to make them, you know, ride them hard. Mm. In, the, in the world of elite sport, how do you lead high performance? Because it's a different beast to leading someone who's middle or low performer. How do you do that? Yeah, I think having absolute clarity on you know, okay, what are what what is the strategy? Or what are the outcomes? But what are the strategy? And you know, who's accountable? And, and, and who? Yeah, being really clear on responsibilities, and you know, that's something that yeah, uh, that that sometimes I've done well, sometimes I haven't. Um, yeah, previous bosses to me, yeah, you know, I was. You know, a self-starter and could navigate my way and and under, and you know would work to my roles and responsibilities. Whereas I'm finding different people, different age groups, different demographics. You know, you know some people need some yeah you know, some really strong guidelines or frameworks and direction, whereas you know others don't. So that's that's part of working out yeah you know, who needs what and and then sort of putting a plan in place and then um, you know, working your way through it. I think you've just got right to the heart of what it means to lead a high performer. It's different for everyone. Yeah. Some high performers are really needy. Yeah. Others are self-starting like yeah. yourself. Yeah. Um, and and I remember being in one club where I was coaching and there was one athlete who, for me, was probably one of the most professional and best players in the team. He was playing for the national team. But boy, was he needy. You know, just always needed more coaching, always needed... So he needed to be just constantly pushed back to work on things and ensure that... He was right, but then others, they never wanted to even talk to you. They were fine, yeah. they were off, you know, they were on their own world. They just wanted to touch base every now and then. Yeah. That's really the world of, of high performance, isn't it? Yeah, no, look, look it is, and it's a, yeah, it's really understanding the people that are inside your organisation, and, and you know, particularly when you go through so much change. You know, we, we had a, a boardroom lunch on uh, Wednesday this week, and you know, I actually referenced that you know, the, the chairman, the CEO, the head coach and the GM of, of rugby, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're getting leadership alignment, but we're actually, we, we've only been doing this for six months together. Like, mm. it, it will take time. Um, but, but also, yeah, yeah, it does take time to, to, you know, to, lear- to learn you know, how people tick and what they need. And, and um, you know, one of the great experiences for me was the, um, yeah, we, we've got this uh, group, the, uh, of our leadership called the trust tank and how to deal with a head coach after a loss you know, and you know, I knew uh, Tony our previous head coach and I knew what time he'd be up when he'd be looking at the tape when was a good time to ring um, and you know Either, either knowing Tony was four o'clock, it was take five o'clock. <laughs> that's yeah. that's correct. He was ready for phone calls at six. That, and you know, that's it. Did, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I, I knew full well that he'd done three hours work and that he he probably got to the end of what he needed to do and and was almost ready for a call after he'd uh, destroyed half a pack of cigarettes. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but working with Dave as a new head coach and and the, yeah, he made a comment after we had a we had a tough loss against Crusaders and he, he said. You know, it was really in, on the Monday when we did our trust tank meeting. He said, "What was really interesting for him was that the only he received four phone calls that day, and he said they were all from ex coaches or, or people that you know, that mentors. Um, yeah, so he, uh, he actually had Eddie Jones, Jake White, I think Nick Styles, and uh, it might have been Todd Loudon. But I think it was the, the, the fourth. Mm-hmm. And he said it's interesting because they know that after a heavy loss." No one wants to speak to them, and yes. it was funny because Paul and um, our chairman and I had both sent Dave a text, and because we're almost not sure, does he want a phone call? Does he want yes. a text? Does he want space? And until we had that conversation, and, and then sort of Dave says, sort of, "Yeah, it was nice for, for people to, to mm. touch base." Whereas, you know, if, if I'd have known Dave well enough early in the season, I didn't not ring because I was. I was, um, yeah, I didn't want to ring, but it was yeah. more, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, he's got a young family. I don't know what his 
post-game routine is, I'll give him a bit of space. I'll just send him a text, and mm. if he needs something, he'll reach out to me. Whereas I, yeah, it was a learning. Yeah, that sure. I should have possibly been a bit more on the front foot. Two things I want to dive into here, which you mentioned. What is the trust tank, and how does that work? Yeah, look, it's it, it's just a well, it's just a name, but yeah, we, previously we we didn't have a CEO in the organisation. We were privately owned, so uh, we had a line, but it, yeah. We didn't have sort of ownership to the to the coach, to the captain, to the, the, the management. So Paul Doherty, with so much change, we decided to yeah that weekly we needed to get together as a group because there's, there's so many moving pieces. The expectations were yeah were moving quickly. Yeah, we, and we just wanted to make sure that from the chairman to myself to the head coach and the GM of footy that yeah that we're all on the same page with our messaging. So yeah. it's Chairman Paul Doherty, yeah. yourself, yeah. Dave Wessel is the head coach, yeah. and I don't Nick, know Nick Ryan. Nick Ryan, yeah. Jim, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. So you yeah. four meet every yeah. Monday, every every week. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. 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 And 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 look, so, yeah, we started off being quite you know, quite formal agendas, mm. and it's been interesting now that, that we've actually loosened up a little bit, and there's been less agendas, and we've actually just been it's just been conversation, and I think we're getting we're probably peeling back the onion a little bit more, and yeah, just yeah, just getting on the same page with you know, even little things with, you know, with with the list and the recruitment. But you know issues, and obviously we've dealt with some at the moment. But messaging, yeah, you know, yeah, with the media that week, and yeah, just a, just a, ultimately just a support network, mm-hmm. but an information sharing and, and alignment Paul, process. A, alignment, yeah. And Paul's also brought in one or two guests that that, that have just sat in on the meetings and and, and all given us posed some questions for us to think about, mm-hmm. uh, which has been terrific. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, Andrew Newbold, who is in the AFL Commission, that was with with Hawthorne. He came in one day, and his first comments, he um, he he got us. Yeah, he's very direct and upfront, and you know, he got us between the eyes um, straight away about his very first impression walking into the building. Um, so to have some external eyes or some external inputs is really good. So yeah, we know that we need to grow, but it's also sometimes you can you can get caught in the bubble. So yeah, there's a really good opportunity, and I think if we've got that alignment. Yeah, then there's no surprises, and the, and then we back each other, and it's, it's interesting that you know, that, yeah, when when I'm in a board meeting now, you know, I can almost, I know what Paul's going to say you know, when there's certain questions come up, and he, you know, he knows almost the same because because we we're on the same page, and we and we know where the club's at, and and it's it's working well, but we, yeah, we've got a long way to go, but having that alignment has been great for all of us. Mm. Well, I just love that alignment. I also love the name. It could create an incredible frame in that meeting, and it's about building trust. I think that's that's really powerful. Yeah. Funnily enough, I think even the names that people give to meetings can make a big difference. It yeah. does create uh, or, or dictate the quality of conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second thing you mentioned there about uh, Dave is some of his old mentors called him. I want to ask you about your own. Yeah. Have you had any really important mentors in your career that have helped you through particularly challenging times? Mm. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I, uh, I think two two very influential people in my career. I, I had uh, four years at, at Sydney University and, and I worked under at, at President David Mortimer and, and I learnt a lot from him. He was a terrific man, very giving man, but yeah, his his expectations and standards were very the bar was always set very high and that was something that I really learnt and liked about Sydney University that uh, that didn't matter what year it was or who was in the team or how the club was going, but the uh, we, yeah the expectations uh, yeah were very clear and high and yeah he had a great work ethic and, and uh, yeah he, he also showed me um, how to make some really tough decisions, uh, which was good. Uh, and then, how did he teach you how to do that? Oh, look, I, I think when there was issues, he addressed them really quickly. He didn't, he didn't let them manifest or dealt with them, and, and he did it in a personal way. Uh, but, he, but he was very, very quick. You know, and yeah, he's, he's a successful businessman and not a great rugby mind. But he could, yeah, he could either smell things, see things, and if he didn't like it, or yeah, he, he would delve down into it, and yeah. he would be fairly direct. And yeah, I think he had the respect of everyone. That there was times in one of those years we were mid mid year, we were really struggling. Uh, even though we ended up winning the premiership, we were really struggling, and he made. A really tough call on, uh, on one of the assistant coaches. Change made some change during the season, which is doesn't mm-hmm. normally happen, and realigned and, and uh, did some things with with a couple of the the team leaders, and and uh, end up going on to you know, run 13, 13 in a row post mm-hmm. his decision. And there was a little bit of good fortune and momentum and, and all those sort of things, but uh, yeah, I thought, wow, there's 
um, yeah, some no, tough, decisions. Some tough decisions. Yeah, right? but he, yeah. he, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. He got personal. Yeah. He, de- yeah. he delved into getting yeah. some more data. That's right. Sound of it. Yeah, fantastic. And probably the other one that yeah, I really need to mention was was Rob Clark, who's um, mm-hmm. yeah, he's been involved with with rugby for a long time. And I was actually in Canberra back when he was CEO of the Brumbies, and yeah, we didn't have a, a strong relationship, but I sort of watched and learnt a lot and saw how he managed the Brumbies back in the early two thousands when they won a premiership, and, and I thought, yeah. Yeah, what a classy guy and what a good job he did and you know, I was fortunate enough to, to work with Rob in 2014 and then when he left we stayed particularly close and he acted certainly as a mentor for me and continues to do that today and he's someone that often will say to me you know, steady hand on the tiller and also be a sounding board but also push me on certain things that he knows that are a little bit uncomfortable which you know, he's outside of the outside of the bubble and but he's also got the ability to give people confidence and you, know, you almost feel like you're going on a journey with him. Mm. Well, let's talk about the bubble, because I think elite sport is a fascinating, almost social experiment. Mm. What do you think people misunderstand about what it's like inside a professional sporting club? Oh, yeah, look, I, I think looking from the outside, if you haven't been involved in sport, there's, there's a number of different things that people see. The glamorous side of, say, for example, Super Rugby, obviously, you know, the, the travel and you know, what people think isn't great to travel to you know, Japan and South Africa and New Zealand and, and yeah, Argentina, etc. But I remember in 2014 when I first started doing it, I was thinking, how good is this? But it does wear you out. You actually look forward to your home games, staying at home, etc. So the travel is a misconception. And, and obviously, the lifestyle and, and the money. But look, I, I know that. The a number of players yeah we've got a range from anything from 18 all the way through to you know we had Jeff Parling at 34 so we had uh, yeah you've got a big cross section and, and yeah particularly for a lot of young guys you know they're they're absolutely learning on the run learning yeah they go through their pressures and yeah there's, they're just 18 year old kids that's right yeah yeah there's, mm-hmm. there's mental health issues and there's lots of things that happen inside the bubble that probably the, the outside world don't see as we talked about before it, it can be yeah, it can be highly emotional you know you're in a results based industry and if you don't get the results you know it can be quite brutal and I think also that you know, certain people say oh you know you're working in rugby and yeah what do you do in the off season and surely that yeah you just put your feet up and you just cruise along for the summer uh, but the the, the, the nature of professional sport now is that you know, what you do in the off season obviously sets you up for the following season. But it is eleven months of yeah, you know, and the, yeah, there's, there's different intensities, but it's full on throughout the whole year, and it's quite relentless. I think that's a classic misconception: is that sport has a huge off season that makes life is easy, but it's not. It is really very, very intense for a long, yeah. long period of time, even out of season. Right, Chief. More from Baden in a minute. Now, recently I spoke with Simon Mannering, CEO of We First, on brand movements, leading with we and nailing a pitch. Here's what Simon had to say about building pride in your staff. They're robbing not only the company of their greatest and best use, but they're also robbing themselves of the satisfaction, that part of your life where you feel good about where you work every day and you wake up every day and you feel like you're glad to work there. It really does atrophy your whole life. And there's nothing worse than being in a job that you don't like, or you don't believe in the leaders, or you don't believe what they're they're taking to market. And I think employees, and especially younger demos, are getting so choiceful now, especially here in the States. There's such an activist mentality now, which is, you know, what do you, what does working at your company say about me? Yeah. You know, and, and do you do you have do you embody the badge value that I want to say about myself when I tell someone where I work? You can listen to that remarkable chat with Simon by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash two eighty nine. And while you're there, the entire back catalogue of chiefs and gurus can be found at chiefmaker.com forward slash listen now. Let's listen dash now. Righto, Chief, let's get back to our best of series with Baden Stevenson of the Melbourne Rebels. I'd love to understand more about learning and the assets or that you keep building. What what are you trying to master right now? Yeah, well, I think, as I, as I touched on before, I think just being able to roll into 2019 with a very clearly defined strategy across all parts of our business and then really implementing that, that strategy. Um, so refining the strategy yeah. and implementation, just... Yeah. Yeah mastering that no that's right and then yeah how are you learning to do that is that using the sounding board of guys like the the chairman paul and yeah. Rob clark you, you bounce yeah. ideas off them and... no absolutely no we, we, we've sort of broken down all commercial rugby we've also got a strategic review panel looking at all of our player welfare and our disciplines and our processes and protocols etc so right across the board we've got the mirror out and we're having a really mm. good look at ourselves and, and sometimes yeah when you're in the 
you know, the start of the season, you don't have time to actually make significant changes or to stop. You, you might be able to change slightly. So, and like, likewise with our rugby program, yeah, you know, we've come yeah you know, considerable way you know, under Dave and, and Will Markwick, our, our athletic performance guy. So, okay, where do we get to? Yeah, you know, where do we need to get to? And I think the great thing about working here at Amy Park in Melbourne, we're in the sporting precinct, so we can learn off some of the other sports. And you know, we're having a good look at and rapport with the Storm at the moment and mm-hmm. learning from them. No, I mean, Storm, the National Rugby League team. For, for those who don't know, yeah, yeah. 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 So there's there's, yeah. there's lots of lots of learning, and, and ultimately, you know, I think because I've been so busy this year, I've gone a little bit away from what I was strong at. I would say that you know, one of my strengths. Is, is building relationships and being a real people person and I've found myself I've probably spent too much time in this office and that I need to get out and, and I need to I need to really understand our staff and, and our players and, and really build on the foundations of some of the relationships within the, within the club and I know that I need to be particularly tight with my staff if, if we're going to go on a journey and achieve what we want to. If you could recommend one book to people in the middle management or, or anyone in a leadership role what book would you recommend? I read one, that, and I've actually referred back to it a couple of times this year, and it's just called Mindset. There's nothing earth-shattering in the book, but it's, it's a good reflection on growth mindset and, and closed mindset and, and you know, different scenarios, and I've found myself just flicking back through a couple of little chapters or so or referencing it. And one of the things that Dave Wessel said when he very first walked into the office in his, in his first week, he said, yeah, and obviously we've come through a difficult time, but he said... Everyone still seems very sad. Yeah, and one of the things that, yeah, not that I learned from him and that we've all been working on is that your mindset or, or, your, or your, your, emotion. your, your emotions are contagious. Mm. And so, yeah, it, it's important that, um, yeah, if, if people are up, often, often people will follow. And, and likewise, if they're down, and, you know, I think that we've just gone through such a, a long period of sort of dark clouds hanging over the club that you almost forget that you're in a privileged position. You're working in sport. Yeah, you've got a huge opportunity and uh, you're around like-minded people. So... I think that understanding you know, your mindset and, and what sort of attitude you bring into the workplace every day is something that we, I think we're all working on. Mm. What I'd like to do now is hit you with all the closing questions. Yep. Every CEO or chief or guru has to answer these questions. Yep. So I'd love for you to have a go and see what you can come up with here, mate. So what is the next thing in life you're most excited about? Well... In, in the absolute short term, I mean, this, this year it's been a huge learning curve and, and the, the fatigue, um, so I'm fortunate enough to be heading up to Port Douglas for my, my mother-in-law's 70th at the end of August, so that's something that, uh, that I absolutely can't wait for to get a, little, get a week of sun and, and duck away for, for a week. But, yeah, look, I think ultimately what I'm really excited about is, you know, I've seen huge growth within the organisation and, 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 and hopefully a little bit of growth in myself as well. And I think that, you know, the, the starting point and the, and the platform that, you know, from where we started last year's pre-season to what we, where we're going to start this year is significantly different and, you know, just really excited to keep building and, and to, you know, to have a big crack for, for next year. Mm. And how do people connect with the Rebels? What's the best way to, to connect with the Melbourne Rebels? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that we've, you know, that we probably went away from in, in, in the last year, particularly in 2017, is there was a little bit of disconnect with the, with the local community. And, you know, Melbourne Rebels, you know, there's, I think there's 20-odd professional sports teams here, so and we know that you know, we're never going to compete with with AFL. But, but we, you yeah, know, we have a good fan base here and, and a lot of people that are, are interested or engaged with rugby. And it's important for us to open the arms up. We want them in the tent. Uh, we want them part of the club. And also, yeah, we've got a, a lot of, a lot of expats here in in Melbourne, and uh, you know, and New Zealand games are uh, are our, our biggest draw cards each year. But yeah, you know, we're, we're working on strategies to try and make sure that you know, if, if, if the Rebels aren't your favourite team, they're at least their second favourite team, and, and those that are engaged with rugby, um, yeah, are on board mm. with the Rebels. And yeah, and, so come uh, to a game. Yeah, is it MelbourneRebels.com today? You? Yeah, that's it. Mm. Yeah, and follow on all the social channels. And yeah. Get on down. It's a great night. Yeah, at Stockade. yeah, no, definitely. Mm. Yeah, no, we're, we're working pretty hard in our in the digital space. So I think that's you know a great way to try and connect with people these days is to make sure that they feel part of the club. And it was interesting. We had a guy that came over from that was doing some professional development from, from overseas, and he came in, in in January and he said, you know what's really funny? He said uh, I walked in here. And he said I felt like I've already been in here. And he said so whoever's doing a digital, you know, are doing a good job because you actually feel like you're part of the club. If, if you're really if you're watching you know, the video pieces and the you know the social media, it, it sort of does connect you and it gives you a good insight into the club. And the great thing at the moment 
and I don't think it's been a real ripple's trait, is that you know, there's no real egos here and, and we want to build a family club and we want to want to be a club that Melbourne are proud of. And I think at certain stages, you know, we're starting to starting to see that and starting to achieve that. But you know, if, we're, if we're going to talk that up, we need to, we need to walk it as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, what are you most grateful for in life? Oh, many things. Uh, yeah, obviously the uh, my, my family, and yeah, ultimately I'm, I'm mid forties and, and CEO of a great organisation, and something that probably uh, you know, a dream or something down the track that you know, would be great to do. And you know, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to you know, live in the dream. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, working in, I mean, working in Melbourne in, in, in sport, it is quite unique. Um, and yeah, Mel, the Melbourneians, like I, I didn't have a great appreciation for AFL when I, I came mm-hmm. to Melbourne, but they love their sport, and you just get swept up in it. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's a great city to live in. Absolutely, yeah. sporting capital of the world. I think there's no other. As you say, twenty professional sporting clubs. Yeah. Most cities have a couple. Yeah. Cool. Can you nominate another CEO or chief you hold with great respect? You'd love to hear put in the hot seat on the show. Yeah, no, definitely. There's a gentleman, uh, Ron Steiner, who, who's the CEO of Maxia, who he actually does our, our MCing of our chairman's clubs. And he was former CEO of Victorian Rugby, and he's just a great guy. And he's just someone that you know, I've, you know, I've learned a lot, but I respect him highly. And he's very, very engaging. He's always in a room full of people, but when you're talking to him, you've got his attention. And look, he's very articulate, he's wise. But I, I think he's a good person, first and foremost, mm. and then a good businessman and successful businessman that's also uh, holds true to the right things in life. He's mm. the first question he always asks me is, "How's my family?" You know, and he's very proud of his own family, and you know, just a great guy and, and an interesting guy, an interesting journey. Mm. Oh, I'll try and trap him on yeah. the show and, yeah. and, and hear more from him. Yeah. Now, if you could lead any organisation in the world, now you're already in the dream role, <laughs> so right, so excluding the rebels, which is the dream job. If yeah. you could lead any company in the world, what would it be? That's a that's a really good question. Um, Look, I, I think if, you, if, I'm, if I'm true to myself, I, uh, I'd like to uh, you know, continue to lead a job that, uh, that I'm passionate about. And I think that sport has been a huge part of my life. I think that uh, it might not be a company, but you know, when you look at you know, the successful AFL clubs in, in town and you know, I look at Richmond across the road even, and you know, they've got 100,000 members, they're premiers. Yeah, they're filling out the MCG. It's, it's just an organisation that you just think, wow, imagine leading something as huge as, huge as that. Mm, absolutely, that would be a cracking organisation to lead. Okay, time for you to wax lyrical. What is the final message of wisdom and hope you think is vital for the next generation of executives? The floor is yours. Go for as long as you like. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we touched on it before. I think being flexible, but understanding the, the different people in your organisation, understanding you know, what motivates them and, and how they learn. And you know, that's, that's something that every leader needs to understand in your organisation and, to, and that you can't treat everyone the same. But trying to really build strong relationships. I think communication is the key, you know, up, up and down. I've sort of been you know, in a bit of a funnel, working up to my board and managing up and managing down is something I think that anyone in whatever level you're at, I think if you've got strong communication, the flow is something that, that, that's, uh, that's needed in a successful business. And lastly, is to make sure that people feel valued in their organisation. I think that sporting organisations can be quite brutal, but I think if people feel valued, that they'll go over and above for you and be passionate and, and be really driven. Nate and Stevenson, thank you for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was great to talk. All right, Chiefs, that sums it up for this week. I'm sure you'll agree. Baden is a truly inspirational leader. And I can tell you now, as time goes on, the Rebels are rising. One beautiful move after another, and that is a club that is building something extra special into the future. You can get all the links and resources. Just go to chiefmaker.com forward slash 290. And if you want to hear more from Baden, in another episode, I asked Baden to join two other CEOs of note in a group session on the power of metrics in scoreboards. Just go to chiefmaker.com forward slash 272. Now, Chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the Chiefs and gurus on the show bring to their life and career. So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now. Give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy and leave a short review about your favourite episode. Righto, Chief, as always, remember, Stay 